It was a magical night under the lights at Lavelle Edwards Stadium on Saturday night for the BYU Cougars. Now that they're 4-0 and nationally ranked, are they ready to go from being the hunter to being the hunted? You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first view and or listen of the day. Appreciate all of you who like to call everydayers right here on your original daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Game Time. Download the Game Time app today, create an account, and use the promo code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. All right, the BYU Cougars are 4-0. They're ranked number 22 in the country in both the USA Today coaches poll as well as the AP Top 25 poll. And I think it's a just reward for the BYU football program after a monster win on Saturday night. 38-9, to the final over the Kansas State Wildcats. Uh, those of you who did not see it, I would encourage you to go back and check out my postcast edition of podcasts I do in the wee hours after BYU plays a football game and give you my initial reaction to it. On Mondays during the football season, we do what we like to call Film Review Monday. And I want to start off today talking about the fact that BYU is nationally ranked because now that the Cougars are in the top 25 polls, they're 4-0 on the season. They're headed to Baylor. And if you look at the different sports books out there, BYU is anywhere from a slight favorite to pick them to a slight underdog against the Baylor Bears in Waco on Saturday. I can tell you this much, though, about how Baylor is going to approach this game. Dave Aranda and his staff from the Baylor uh, football program are going to tell their guys, you're the underdog. They have a target on their back. You have to go take them down because they are now the favorites. They are the nationally ranked team. They're first place in the Big 12 Conference. BYU under Kalani Satake has thrived for most of his tenure as an underdog. When they are overlooked, they routinely seem to outperform those expectations. Now, can they prove something they have proven at times, but not often enough for my liking, is that now that they are nationally ranked, they are going to be a team that is going to have a proverbial target on their back from other schools in the Big 12 Conference. Can they thrive now as being one of the big dogs? That's a great question. The FPI rankings out there, the football percentages index, the ESPN puts out after each game, they get updated and they fluctuate uh, depending how the results of each game go. Have BYU currently slated to win between eight and nine games this season? Be a remarkable turnaround from a five and seven a season ago to have BYU finished eight and four or nine and three. I said after the game on Saturday that I needed to reset expectations for the BYU football program because I had set them at a six and six mark as being the expectation for me going into the campaign. Well, now that BYU is four and zero. Oh, you got to reset that. And I think that eight and four is a very admirable goal, uh, all things considered, because they are now going to have to have uh, an ability to fend off all comers. Baylor is a decent team. Uh, had an absolutely uh, dismal performance down the stretch against Colorado. They very well should have won that game. Had they, you know, knocked down one pass at the end of the game, they very well may have left uh, Boulder with the victory. But they're a little down on their luck right now, uh, smarting after that loss to Colorado. But they are not a bad team by any means. And as I mentioned, they're going to look at BYU as a heavy favorite coming into their house. BYU, the last time they played in Waco, remember, Gary Bohannon ran roughshod over the BYU Cougars in that 2021 contest. So they have got to be able to go in and handle their business. We've talked a lot about BYU controlling the controllables. What can they control? They can control their effort level, obviously. They can control the fact that the offense has continued to make progressional steps towards being what I consider to be a good offense. It's not elite yet. It's not even, I think, great. But they have made steps towards being a good offense in the Big 12. The BYU defense, absolute revelation. The first time in program history, according to history in terms of historical documents, suggest the first time they have not given up a passing touchdown through the first four games of a season. They haven't allowed the two power four opponents they've played to date to score even a touchdown in those games. The three touchdowns they've given up have come on kind of, in many respects, garbage time type situations. It's an incredible defense that we're seeing from BYU. So that's a controllable. 
Take that same defensive effort. Take it to Waco and let it help you grind out a victory over the Baylor Bears. What else can you control? Penalties. BYU is one of the least penalized teams this season. I looked it up. It's 19 penalties overall in the year through four games. That's less than five per game. And that's, I know that some of you would say, well, they should play penalty free. Yes, absolutely. In a, per, in a perfect world, BYU would be penalty free, but it happens. You have a guy maybe flinch on the offensive line. You have a guy grab a guy a little too long in the defensive backfield to get a defensive holding call. Mistakes will happen. Five penalties you can live with. You start to go uh, eight, nine, ten, double digits. That's when it becomes an issue. That's a controllable. The biggest thing I want to see from BYU as they turn their attention out to Baylor before they hit a bye week is A, handle your business. Go out there and play as a big dog. It's been something that BYU sometimes has struggled with under Kalani Sitake is when they are that favorite in a matchup, that they seem to play down to the level of competition they have played against. But when they've been the underdog, remember, they play up. And Kansas State's just kind of the latest example of that. And the other point I want to add to this is that Kalani Satake has proven routinely during his time as BYU's head coach that the month of September, BYU's a really, really good team. As the calendar turns, though, into October and November, that's when things get a little more dicey. That's a conversation to talk about when the calendar actually does change after this matchup against the Baylor Bears. I'm looking forward to it. I think this is a big opportunity for BYU to legitimize themselves once again in the eyes of many people out there. Some of uh, you pointed out, and I saw it in my comments on YouTube as well as on social media, that some of the AP Top 25 voters didn't even have BYU in their polls. I think we know who stayed asleep on Saturday night or did not uh, watch BYU play against Kansas State. We've got one voter out there. I think he covers, um, was it on the East Coast somewhere? Uh, Virginia, maybe like that. Has BYU at number 12 in his poll? Wow. Incredible scenes for the BYU Cougars. But now they turn their attention to Baylor, looking to further their record to 5-0 and and once again prove that this is a team that learned very hard but rewarding lessons from what their debut in the Big 12 uh, entailed a season ago. Baylor's just the next step in the progression along this path BYU's taking this season, but feels like the Cougars are riding high right now, and I'm looking forward to seeing how they once again handle now the transition from being that quote-unquote hunter to being the hunted, and I hope they succeed in that journey. All right, coming up here in just a minute, what else did I learn after re-watching the BYU-Kansas State game? There's a few things that pointed that stood out to me amongst the incredible scenes that entailed that middle eight, the six and a half minutes roughly, the BYU piled up 31 unanswered points. We'll talk about more of my takeaways, and we'll also talk about what they mean for BYU. What is, what's by the way, what is stuff that you can count on in, in a game-to-game -game basis, and what is the stuff that's kind of the one-off? We'll try and make heads and tails of that as you roll on right here on Locked on Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Now, FanDuel is here for you guys to help you guys have some fun with the NFL season underway. You can start the season with a big return with our friends at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. When you get the hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets with our friends at FanDuel. The app is super easy to use. Even if you're not an NFL guy, you're college football, uh, you're into hockey because you have the Utah Hockey Club made their debut yesterday. They won 5-2 to two over the St. Louis Blues in Des Moines, Iowa. You want to take a, a shot on them taking on the Los Angeles Kings tonight. FanDuel has got all of those options for you guys and a bevy more out there for you guys. So the best part is once again, you get a great return from our friends at FanDuel. Go to FanDuel.com and bet, place a $5 bet and get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place that once again, that $5 bet. $5 bet, $200 in bonus bets courtesy of our friends over at FanDuel. Go to FanDuel.com to get started today. That's FanDuel.com. Of course, they once again, they are America's number one sports book. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first view or listen of the day. If you have not done so already, I encourage you guys to check out the Locked On College Football Podcast. You may see a familiar face or hear a familiar voice on today's edition. I had a great opportunity to catch up with Spencer McLaughlin, the host over there of Locked On College Football. It's a great podcast. It gets you kind of apprised of all things going on in the college football universe. And BYU is one of the big stories nationally. When you upset a team the caliber of Kansas State, there's no doubt you're going to get more national attention. So check it out. It's Locked On College Football, wherever you get your podcasts. Also available on YouTube. And of course, it's a proud to be part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what did I take away after rewatching the BYU game? Well, I kind of came away in the camp that BYU has 
very good things happening for it. Obviously, you create your own luck in many respects when it comes to college football. I think case in point, you look to the interceptions and the fumble that Jack Kelly caused. Those, those three turnovers, BYU cashed into the tune of 21 points. I say it often on this podcast. I'm not the only one who says it, but good teams make you pay for your mistakes in college football. When you get a turnover, you want to turn that into seven points. You want to just make it hurt for the opposing team. And that's exactly what BYU did Saturday night. Something that I love that I think is a sustainable thing from those three turnovers for BYU is remember the punch out or the strip from Jack Kelly proves once again, that he is just an absolutely insanely talented football player. I'm not sure what the ceiling is for Jack Kelly, but when he gets that ball out and all of a sudden Tommy Prasis is, I say Tommy on the spot, scoops it up and rumbles in from uh, 20, whatever yards out for a touchdown that flipped this game on its head. That's when the pressure mounted for Avery Johnson. And I saw rewatching this game that Jay Hill said, all right, game on everybody. Let's do this thing. Moments after that uh, scoop and score for the touchdown, remember, it was a zone blitz that BYU ran that Avery Johnson ended up throwing that interception to uh, Tyler Batty. Incredible play. Uh, by the way, Tyler Batty, props to you for being able to do that. Showed off your athleticism as a big man, 6'5", 280, whatever you weigh, to go down low and scoop that pass and get your hands underneath and make sure it did not touch the ground. Incredible effort in that. But as I rewatch this game, and some of you may have seen it yourself, as Avery Johnson comes out the field and he's pulling off his helmet, there's a coach that asks him essentially, hey, what, what happened out there? I can't be 100% certain because my lip reading skills are not elite, but I'm fairly certain that he said, I didn't see him. What that means is he didn't see Tyler Batty drop back from his defensive end position in a zone blitz concept right into that throwing lane that he ended up throwing it right to him. That screams to me that Jay Hill had Avery Johnson in the Kansas State offense exactly where he wanted, and he ratcheted up the pressure said, all right, we're blaring in a corner off the other side to pressure Avery Johnson into throwing this pass early, and Tyler Batty sat right in that hole in the zone and picked it off. Incredible play. Then, after halftime, Kansas State uh, gets it to halftime. Then BYU comes back out. What happens then? Well, Jay Hill says, all right, I got this kid by the toes, if you want to use that expression. He's just essentially, I've got this kid right where I want him. What does he do next? He starts to bring more pressure from BYU, but he also uses zone concepts beyond that. The Harrison Tagger interception was a case of what I believe is what they use the term seeing ghosts. When a quarterback is under pressure and all of a sudden they're starting to feel pressure, whether real or imagined, in the case of that play, remember Tyler Batty nearly had a sack on that play, but all of a sudden Avery Johnson steps up, feels the pressure, and throws an incredibly ill-advised pass in the middle of the field that Harrison Taggart reaches up and picks off. If Harrison Taggart doesn't get it, well, guess who's going to get it? Crew Wakely. Crew Wakely under, uh, undercut that route, and the ball was not thrown well at all. Jay Hill saw the the writing on the wall in that circumstance it was about well, it ended up being three or four minutes of game time and said all right we got this kid right where we want him let's turn up the pressure and see how he responds and frankly avery johnson crumbled in that moment can he respond and get better from it yes he will learn from that moment his coaches i'm sure speaking to avery johnson in film review will point out exactly what jay hill and the byu defense did to him and he'll improve from that but it paid off in a big way for BYU. And that's one thing I pointed to, uh, I wanted to point out, is that BYU can build on that. When you can see, or I guess in this case, it'd be more of a feel thing for Jay Hill because he's a veteran coach who has run these schemes and seen these schemes time and time again. When he sees moments like that, that is why Jay Hill is paid as handsomely as he is. And I hope that BYU continues to pay him more handsomely to keep him on BYU sideline. He is an absolutely insanely talented play caller and defensive coordinator. I, I, I can't say enough good things about who, what he did in that circumstance. Um, other things I took away from this game. I really liked what I saw from BYU's offensive line. Are they elite yet? No. And I think Connor Pay will come on the podcast this week and he will admit uh, to as, as much as that because he doesn't believe that they're playing at an elite level. But if you take away the sack yardage for Jake, and I want to get talk about the sack yardage in a moment, BYU ran for their best overall output in terms of their overall running game uh, on the season. They're making steps bit by bit by bit, and they're winning football games as a result. I really like the progression I'm seeing. Does it need to still go up? Absolutely. 
I don't think BYU can hope for much more than eight and four, nine and three, if they can't sustain drives longer than they are uh, capable of sustaining them right now. A couple of you pointed it out to me in postcast saying, Jake, I'm not a believer in this offense. They haven't been able to sustain drives. I wanted to quibble with that, but rewatching it, I can admit I'm wrong in that circumstance. BYU does need to be able to sustain drives better. And you look at the drives BYU had to mount in the game against Kansas State. There weren't very many of them because they got uh, their, I think their starting average field position was the pl uh, plus 44, speaking of the opponent 44 yard line. I might have been there for you. It was good field position regardless because short fields will do that for you. But when BYU had drives they started to put together, remember their second and third ones in the first and second quarter, BYU had a good thing going. Sacks got them behind the chains and BYU did not respond well. Third down percentage continues to be a sore point for this BYU offense. They have got to find a way to stay ahead of the chains and maintain that momentum they get. There's still decision-making at times from uh, Jake Retzloff. I think that sack he took, remember, they were going uh, from uh, south, no, sorry, uh, north to south. There's a third drive. He takes that sack down in the red zone. That's a play that you throw out of the back of the end zone in the general direction of a receiver and don't take that sack yardage. Brock Osweiler, who's a quarterback, pointed that very thing out on the broadcast. You eat that yardage. BYU's offense right now, is not capable of overcoming getting behind the chains. And I'd like to see them get to that point, but until it happens, they've got to avoid self-inflicted wounds. Outside of that, I think the decision-making from Jake Retzloff was absolutely brilliant in this game. We are seeing him, along with the rest of the BYU offense, take steps in a positive direction right now for BYU. Zero turnovers from him. Really no ill-advised throws that I believe were ill-advised in that game against Kansas State. We're seeing a quarterback coming of age. I said it Saturday night. I'll reiterate it right now. He has played eight, count them, eight career games as BYU starting quarterback. Remember, Jaron Hall, Zach Wilson, John Beck. You can go back through the history books of BYU quarterbacks eight games into their career. I don't think that they were elite in many respects in that circumstance or those circumstances that they found themselves in. I can remember Zach Wilson being criticized. I can remember Jaron Hall being criticized early on as BYU starting quarterback. I think Jake Retzloff is going to end up being a, a very, very capable quarterback for BYU. I think he's just getting judged a little more harshly because the level of competition that he is facing is quite literally better than any other quarterback in BYU football history. You can argue with me all, all you want on it, but remember, BYU wasn't a Power 4 member, and we talked as a fan base and in the media about how BYU wanted to prove themselves against the best of the best. They're doing it now, and we're seeing Jake Retzloff grow up right before our very eyes, to use that uh, term, uh, as he continues to progress along the path. And I think he's going to become a very good quarterback. Could that be uh, curbed at some point? Yes, it could. Things could happen. He could go back to being an awful decision maker like we saw at points against SMU and going back to last season. But I really do think we're seeing a quarterback who is doing a very good, very good job of being cognizant of not making ill-advised mistakes out there. I think he's learning and he's getting better and better as we go along. And I think the offense is, as a whole is getting better as we go along. Other thing on the offense that I think is going to help. Sione Moa really emerged. And I'm not saying anything that's revelatory here. But one thing that po was pointed out to me that I missed, I had completely forgotten about this. Do you guys know where his hometown is listed as on a BYU's website? No, it's not Tempe High School. He was a former 5A MVP in the state of Utah at Tempe High School, ran for 2,200 yards and a gazillion touchdowns as a Tempe Thunderbird. He grew up in the Inland Empire down in Southern California. You know, one of the great BYU running backs of late have come out of the Inland Empire. Oh, some guy named Jamal Williams and another guy named Tyler Algier. I don't know what BYU is doing down in the, what they, they like to call the IE in, in down in Southern California, but they are routinely finding guys who are capable running backs out of that area. Sione Moa appears to be the next guy. Uh, and LJ Martin, I hope he gets back soon. I, I said it before, I'll say it again. I don't expect to see him until after the bye weeks when BYU takes on Arizona on October 12th. That's when I expect to see him back in action for BYU if all goes well. But in the meantime, Sione Moa is 5'10", 210 pounds, and he runs angry. That touchdown run, the final touchdown run of the night that he had, it was a third and eight, and he rumbles through. It felt like uh, every Kansas State defender's attempt to tackle him. He runs with power. He runs with balance. I I'm telling you, the comparisons between him and those other Inland Empire running backs, Jamal Williams, Tyler Algier, they're not unfounded. Now, he is early on in his career, and he's obviously going to have to uh, progress and get better. 
But I really, really liked what I saw from him. I, it doesn't take anything away from what we saw from Pokai Haunga either. Pokai Haunga is more in the mold, I think, of a Reno Mahe. If you have a thunder and lightning combo here, to remember when uh, Reno, a.k.a. Junior Mahe, was at BYU, he was more of that scat back, change of pace guy, whereas you had other running backs who were the bigger body, and that's what a guy like Sione Moa is. I think the trio of LJ Martin, Pokai Haunga, and Sione Moa could form the trio that BYU can build their offensive running game around for a good two to three years here if all goes according to plan. Now, you need offensive line play in, in front of that, and I thought the BYU offensive line performed well. Uh, Bruce Mitchell didn't do anything that I thought was going to take away his opportunity to continue to start for BYU. I do wonder once Sonny Moccasini and or Austin Leusa are healthy, if they just get to put put themselves right back into the lineup there or if they if they have to earn it back. But Bruce Mitchell, a converted uh, defensive lineman, I thought was very, very good. So that's just some of the stuff I took away from this game. Harrison Tagger was absolutely awesome at middle linebacker. Remember all the conversation about Ciala Acera should be the middle linebacker. Maybe Ace Kafusi should be the guy. Harrison Taggart said, yeah, no, 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 no. That it's my job. And a career high 10 tackles had the interception. He was absolutely marvelous. I mentioned Jack Kelly. I, I just don't know what level he can continue to rise to, but he continues to show every single game. There's more to see from him. I, I'm absolutely astounded at what we're seeing from this BYU team. Is it sustainable? I don't think the offense can afford to have 241 total yards and expect to win a, a bunch of ball games. They need to get back to running the football and playing complementary football on the offense. But once again, they took advantage of what was given to them in that game. It was a crazy set of circumstances, but good teams will make you pay for those mistakes. And this would be what you did. Can we see against Baylor this week when maybe they're not going to have those same type of turnovers? You're not going to have the home crowd behind you. Can you go out there and sustain those long grinding drives? Can you put together a 10 play drive that ends with a touchdown and it's just demoralizing for the Baylor Bears defense? That's, I think, the next step of progression for this BYU offense. But so far, so good. They're 4 0. And I think that's uh, enough for me to feel good about BYU. All right. Uh, Final stanza of today's podcast. We'll talk a little bit more about what to expect from BYU. We'll also talk about some of the results from BYU uh, teams over the weekend as well. As they wrap up, uh, in speaking of BYU women's volleyball, they wrapped up their non-conference play. We'll wrap up this edition of the Locked on Cougars podcast next. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Game Time. Now, Game Time is here for you guys to get you out to the events you want to go to, whether it's sporting events, music, concert, concert theater, I didn't know what you, uh, you're into comedy. It's all available to you guys from our friends at Price Picks. The best part about the Price Picks app is they've got a really cool feature in it that I absolutely love. I get really, really irritated when I go to buy tickets online at some other ticket marketplace. I see a ticket price, my like, oh, that's a good price. Hit it, and all of a sudden, once I get to the checkout screen, I get hit with feels like 50 different fees that jack up. What you can do with game time is you can toggle what they call the all in pricing feature on the app. You toggle it. It tells you exactly what you're paying right up front. So you know exactly what the overall total is going to be. There's no more getting surprised by uh, the, all those fees that seem to pop up on the other ticketing uh, marketplaces. They also offer the lowest price guarantee or they will credit you 110% of the difference of those tickets. So take the guess, guess we're going to buying your tickets and do it with our friends at game time. Download the game time app today and create an account. We're doing the promo code locked on college. That's locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the promo code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-C-O-L-L-E-G-E. -E -E. That's Locked On College for $20 off. Download the Game Time, to game time app today. What time is it? It's game time. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first view or listen of the days. We often say, if you guys have not done so already, another shameless plug for you guys to join the Locked On Cougars Insider Group. You guys want all the inside scoop of what I'm hearing about BYU football, basketball, and everything in between? Join us on the Locked On Cougars uh, Insider Group. The link is in the show notes, whether you're watching and or listening to this. You get a 14-day free trial, and the best part about it is it's coming in the form of a text message. You don't have to log into a message board or have to go on an app to find out the information I've got. It comes to you in the form of a text message. You can have one-on-one -on -one conversations with myself in-game. We've been doing a lot of that through the first four games of the season. So if you want to join us today, click the link in the show notes below and join us on the Locked On Cougars Insider Group. All right, uh, let's wrap up today's show with a couple of notes uh, from the BYU weekend that was. I want to start off with BYU Women's Volleyball. Congratulations. And then they finished off their uh, non-conference play with a very uh, 
sound three nothing shutout of a UVU and number 19 ranked BYU has had an interesting non-conference slate for women's volleyball. They've had a slew of five match thrillers have lost some have won some, but uh, crazy scenes, obviously. And we'll see how things go as they move now into big 12 play, but I don't count out uh, the BYU women's volleyball team at any point. There's still a reason why they're ranked in the top 20 in the country, even with some of the losses they've absorbed, but congratulations to them on that win over UVU uh, tonight. If you're looking for something to do, BYU women's soccer is going to take on Utah annual rivalry deal in Provo. Uh, it's obviously Big 12 play now with those two, both being in the Big 12 conference. It's at Southfield. Looking forward to this one because the stakes just get, ri they rise even more. It's 7 o'clock tonight. You can catch it on ESPN Plus if you have not had a chance to uh, watch them in person or you don't have the chance to watch them in person, but it's a big, big one. The women's soccer team, similar to women's volleyball team, has uh, struggled through some stuff in the non-conference slate, but looking to ra ramp it up in conference play and you know what? If you can take down your rival in the process, why wouldn't you enjoy that? That, that? So just a couple of notes for you guys on that front with regards to other BYU sports in action. Now, the final thing I've got for you guys on today's show is that uh, the biggest thing with the BYU football program right now is that I think that there's a metrics thing versus the eye test that aren't necessarily always matching up with BYU football. I'm, I'm going to try and make sense of this really quick because we got to wrap up this edition of the podcast. Understand that metrics are out there to help quantify how good or bad things are for a football program. We hear all the time, I talk about FPI, I talk about PFF grades, I, I talk about a lot of this stuff on this podcast, and it's a, it's a way to quantify, like I said, how good or bad things are. In many respects, I still trust what I see with my own eyes and my gut feeling on a lot of things when it comes to the BYU football program. What I saw Saturday night, for example, against Kansas State was a team, speaking of BYU, that believes in itself and is sick and tired of hearing people downgrade them and say that they aren't any good. This is a team that I think, as I mentioned all the time, learned some really, really hard lessons a season ago. There were guys that seemingly quit on that team midseason last year, and it spiraled on them. They lost five straight games to end the year. Yes, they fought hard. I felt like when their back was against the wall against Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, but they cannot afford to have this slip again. And what I am seeing and what I saw Saturday night is a team that learned from that experience last year against uh, Big 12 opposition. They have got eight more of these games. It's going to be an absolute war because guess what? None of these games, even the Houston game, I know Houston doesn't appear to be any good. That's at the end of the season. And BYU could be worn down as they welcome the Houston Cougars uh, to Lavelle Edwards Stadium in late November. Every one of these games upcoming for BYU, they've got to maintain the level of play they showed Saturday night against Kansas State. It is much easier said than done, and anybody inside that program that experienced what happened a season ago can tell you exactly uh, that point that I just made, is that you can talk about it all you want, but until you go through it and really experience it, you can't really uh, go out there and have the, the want to, the desire, the grit, whatever verbiage you want to use to go out there and say, you know what? I got to put my heart and soul on the line here in these games. It's going to take a lot out of this BYU team. I'm very thankful they have a bye week after Baylor this week to regroup a little bit ahead of what I what appears to be a very tough three-game stretch. Arizona, Oklahoma State, and UCF, a road game in Orlando, they're going to test BYU extremely, extremely uh, hard, well, whatever you're, I'm trying to say there in that three-game set. But the nice part is you get through Baylor this week, and whether you're four and one or five and zero, oh, then you reset. You look at the next stanza because the month of October it's been routinely BYU's weakest month under Kalani Satake over the past four to five years. Can they flip that narrative on its head? I believe that they can. But that team, speaking of the team, and Connor Pay will talk about it this week. I'm going to ask him about it. They have to go out there and answer the bell every single week, and I think they learned their lesson from a season ago. And the team I saw, like I said, metrics can tell me one thing. My eyeball test tells me another. I think this is a team that absolutely believes that they can go out there and shock the world. And I hope that they do. They've shocked the world so far. They're 4-0 against all odds. They're 4-0. I think most of you and are in your heart of hearts, when you're doing the math on the season, I would agree with you. I had BYU 2-2 two two at this point. Well, guess what? They're 4-0. 
So let's celebrate that fact. And we'll, uh, we'll continue to look ahead and see what we can find out and learn about this BYU team as they head to Baylor this week. As I mentioned, uh, Connor Pay, expecting to have him on the podcast tomorrow. So look forward to that. Obviously, throughout the week, we'll have plenty of coverage for you guys. We'll catch up with Cam Stewart from Locked On Baylor as well to get his inside scoop on what to expect from the Baylor Bears. So we got plenty for you guys as the week progresses here on the podcast. So as always, thank you for making it your first listen of the day. Thank you to all of you who are everydayers as well. And until tomorrow, everybody, have a great rest of your day. And this has been the Locked On Cougars podcast.